Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Pan Future Society podcast. I am your host, Sean, and today is Sunday, July 24th, 2016. Uh, I am currently rereading Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot. I read it shortly after it came out many years ago, 1994, I think. And uh, there's a little tidbit in here that I thought was worth sharing. Um, Space is very, very big. In fact, it's really difficult to even conceive of how big space is. And uh, some of the things I talk about on this podcast, including what I'm going to talk about today, are about living in space or traveling in space uh, and these vast distances are mind-boggling. Uh, one of the sections in the book, he's talking about the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft. And they've been out there for about 40 years. Uh, one of these spacecraft was the one that took the photo, the, giving the Pale Blue Dot book its name, the famous photo of Earth as a tiny speck in space. Um, these spacecraft, Voyager 1, is traveling at about 38,000 miles an hour. Voyager 2 is about 35,000 miles an hour. In the last few years, uh, the definitions are a little hazy, but the spacecraft have recently crossed the heliopause. That is the part of our solar system where solar winds and particles and, and magnetic fields from our own solar system, our sun, uh, transition into particles and cosmic rays traveling through interstellar space. So it took these craft 40 years to go that far. But, uh, in as Carl Sagan mentions in Pale Blue Dot, if you define the edge of our solar system as the distance which the sun can no longer hold things gravitationally in orbit about it, the Voyager spacecraft will take much longer. Way, way out there is a thing called the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is a horde of comets, perhaps trillions of comets. And these Voyager spacecraft traveling 38,000 miles an hour will still take 20,000 years to reach the Oort Cloud. 20,000 years to fully escape the gravitational influence of our home star. So we could probably put a ship in space and send it out to the cosmos, but it's going to take 20,000 years just to get out of the neighborhood. That is, uh, I don't even know what to say about that, but I thought that was worth sharing because this show and the next show uh, I'm going to be talking about traveling uh, out there in interstellar space and how we might do that. Well, now on to your news of the moment. All right, news for this week is uh, a new map of the human brain. This map contains 180 distinct areas in each hemisphere, and it includes 97 previously undiscovered areas of the brain. This research was published last Wednesday in the journal Nature. This new uh, image of the brain provides the most detailed understanding of the cerebral cortex. This new map is a, quote, major revision and updating of previous maps, end quote, said David Van Essen, senior author of the study. Uh, he also said, most of the new areas are in regions we associate with higher cognitive function. Uh, this version will also continue to be revised as new data is added to it. Dr. Greg Farber, Director of Technology Department at the National Institute of Mental Health, 
uh, also said, quote, you know what maps of the world look like in 1500, and you know what they look like in 1950? I think in terms of resolution and quality, we moved from 1500 to 1950. Uh, he also said, in time, we will get better definition, but he would be very surprised to see major changes to this new parcellation, as Van, as Van Essen refers to it. This map was created using some new methods of looking at imagery of the brain and also combining multiple images from 210 different uh, volunteers and they're also uh, combining the different types of things that they might study about the brain like the architecture the function the co connectivity and the topography of the brain and they took all that information and layered it together to get this new map uh, it's there's a few images online that look pretty cool uh, and i will link to those in the show notes another short news item for you this week physicists in china have ran a new experiment to try to connect classical physics and quantum physics in the uh, ever going quest for a theory of everything one uh, experiment in classical physics um, shows that gravity in a vacuum affects everything equally. Two different objects dropped in a vacuum fall at the same speed. In quantum physics, uh, there should be slight differences. So the scientists used rubidium atoms with opposite quantum spins and used various measurements, uh, lasers, to propel the atoms upward. And then they measured the rate at which they fell. And there was no difference. According to quantum physics, there should have been a difference. So this is sort of uh, another knock uh, against any possible ability to unite quantum physics and classical physics. Uh, however, they do say that perhaps there is some effect, but our current measurement devices can't detect those differences. So they're still working at it, but for now, classical and quantum do not meet. I'll link to a good article in the show notes about this. I'm kind of skimming over the science because I can't pretend to fully understand quantum physics at all. Uh, but this article also has a neat video demonstrating uh, feathers and a large, really something like a bowling ball falling in a vacuum and falling at the same rate. So it's pretty cool. Check it out. That is your news of the moment. All right, this week's main segment, uh, I'm going to do at least a couple of shows about space colonies and generation ships. We've sent a handful of people into space. How are we going to manage thousands? There are a number of different approaches to the problem of how you house many people in space. Setting aside for now the idea of cities on the moon or Mars, which could be much like a city on Earth encased in a dome, I'm going to discuss ships and stations like the Babylon 5 station from the TV show of the same name, or the Rama ship that appears in Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama. There are several potential advantages of using a ship such as these to live in space, and at some point, if civilization is to continue, we have to leave Earth forever. Putting a few people in space is hard. Putting thousands there permanently is exponentially more difficult. Aside from the technological hurdles in structure, food, water, power, recycling, and waste, space is harsh. Radiation, micrometeorites, space debris, and cosmic rays 
are all potential big threats. Thanks to astronaut Scott Kelly's recent year in space on the International Space Station, we will soon be learning more than we have ever known about the long-term effects of zero gravity, but what we know so far isn't good. It does bad things to the body. A large ship or station could alleviate this simply by spinning. You have seen this principle in TV and movies like Babylon 5, Interstellar, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Maybe someday Star Trek-like artificial gravity will be possible, but until then a simple spin is an easy solution. At a very large scale, as depicted in Larry Niven's Ringworld novels, the spin is even enough to hold an atmosphere in place. There was even a proposed centrifuge module for the International Space Station, but it was cancelled. As for the radiation and cosmic rays, cosmic rays are very high energy radiation coming mainly from outside our solar system, large plates of shielding will likely be impractical. Just too much material and some cosmic rays can pass through thick lead with no problem. Also, some materials, like aluminum, can generate uh, cascades of secondary radiation when struck by cosmic rays. A thick enough atmosphere could also provide much protection, as it does here on Earth, but would require a very large station. However, a layer of water in the outer shell of a station could do the trick. Water is good at blocking radiation, and this shield could also supply water for the station. According to some research I found online, only a few centimeters of water is needed. Some type of soil could also be used, but you would need uh, on, or on the order of six feet of it to block enough radiation. However, there are some specific situations where this may also be a practical solution. I have seen some proposals to use electrostatic fields and electromagnetic generators as force fields. Some research in these ideas goes back to the 1950s, but due to the dangers of high voltage and the amount of energy needed to generate a field, no practical designs have been built. Uh, that would essentially be the same thing that protects our planet from solar radiation, as in the Van Allen belts, but I can't imagine artificially generating a field large enough for a space colony. <laughs> On to some of the proposed designs for large space stations. The rotating wheel is one of the oldest proposed stations with artificial gravity, dating back to the early 20th century. This is the design of the space station depicted in 2001 A Space Odyssey. A NASA committee supported building such a station after the Mercury program in the late 1950s, but it was never pursued. A later design called the, a Stanford Taurus would be large enough to house a large city's worth of people, with mirrors being used to reflect the light into the station. Another very early proposed design for space colonies is the Bernal Sphere, uh, proposed in 1929 by John Desmond Bernal. In his design, the sphere could house 20 to 30,000 people, uh, Gerald O'Neill later modified the sphere's potential design for, to allow uh, for spin-generated gravity. O'Neill's designs house about 10,000 people. Another proposed design for a colony is the O'Neill Cylinder, uh, offered by aforementioned physicist Gerald O'Neill in his 1976 book The High Frontier Human Colonies in Space, it takes the form of a large rotating cylinder with alternating panels of land masses and windows to let in light. The original version suggests using two counter-rotating tubes to offset any gyroscopic effects. I have not seen the twin tube design in media, but the single tubes of Babylon 5, Rama, and the colony ship at the end of the movie Interstellar are of this type. I think one of the more interesting things about the cylinder is that gravity lessens the closer you get to the center, as it does with any of the rotating designs. 
this could allow you to actually float weightless at the axis of the rotation. In O'Neill's original design, the cylinders would have been 5 miles in diameter and 20 miles long. At this scale, the atmosphere inside would actually provide much of the needed radiation protection and could even produce small-scale weather systems. If you really want to get an interesting account of potentially living in an O'Neill cylinder, I highly recommend Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama and uh, at least its second book uh, in the series. After that, mm, he co-wrote them with someone else, so not as good as the originals, uh, but they really do, I think, give you a great sort of eyes-on-the-ground idea of what the inside of living inside one of these things might be like. Another idea for a space colony that I've read a little bit about would be to hollow out an asteroid. This seems like a simple idea in some ways compared to building a very large station, since the bulk of the work in making a shell to live in is already done, and thick walls would provide shielding. This would be sort of the soil, six feet of soil uh, shielding idea. With advanced 3D printing, you could also probably construct much of what you need from the material in the asteroid itself. However, it would likely have to be a very large asteroid. Many asteroids are actually not solid at all, but loose clumps of material held together by gravity, and would probably leak even if you could hollow them out without them just falling apart. And if you need raw materials, not all asteroids are made alike. Some are high in metals, other in ices, others still just clumps of rocks and dust, like a uh, pile of gravel stuck together. Still, it's an idea worth pursuing. If we can get one large enough, it could simplify the construction of a station. These are a few of the most likely candidates for a large-scale space colony. In next week's show, I'm going to take a look at what it would take to get a human colony into deep space and beyond. And that is your show for this week. Thank you once again for joining me on the Pan Future Society podcast. Would love to hear from you. You can send me an email at sean at panfuture.org, O-R-G, or visit us online at panfuture.org is the website. You'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter. It would be great to hear from you. If you're living in a part of the world where it's summertime and it's very hot, I hope you're staying cool. If you're in a part of the world where it's wintertime and it's very cold, I hope you're staying warm. And I will talk to you again in the future. Uh, Joe, what's your own target advantage right now, Frank?